Welcome to The Real Board Loft. I'm Trip Foreman. This is the MR Retro 78. And right next to the MR Retro 78, we have the <laughs> Mark Richards, the original MR. So we're here to talk about the MR 78, which uh, we just figured out, we did the math. This board, the design of this board is 38 years old. And uh, this board was way ahead of its time, so far ahead of its time that a lot of the boards right now are actually going in this direction again. And, uh, and, and a lot of them, you know, the main thing about this board is it's just really, really fun. You can see it's got a, a fairly uh, wide, it's got a wider outline, it's got a beak nose with a flatter rocker, and it carries a lot of its width through the tail, right here, in the single wing and the swallow tail. On this one, on the Retro 78, it has uh, a dedicated twin fin, so you're all in on the twin. And uh, Mark will tell us a little bit more about the placement on these fins, but dedicated twin and this is uh i got a guess based on the 78 being in the name that this board is from 78 and this is what mark was riding uh in 1978 so mark tell us a little bit about this board when you made it you know what was everybody surfing at that time like in the competitive scene prior to this board um well at the time everyone was surfing single fins i was actually riding a six foot eight single fin with a very very narrow tail um, and i was competing in contests at that time and I was having trouble because the narrow tail was actually sinking into my surf. So I was kind of competitively, um, I just wasn't getting the performance that I, I wanted out of the single fin. And in 1976, um, Reno Avalira was in Australia for the Coca-Cola contest in Sydney. And he brought with him, a, I guess, a Steve Liss um, inspired fish with a round nose. It was quite short, I think only about five foot four long. Super round nose, parallel rails, you know, huge swallow tail on it, um, a fin on each corner. And Reno rode it in a couple of rounds of coke contest, he went incredibly fast on it. So I spoke to him about the board and he suggested some dimensions for me. So I kind of went home and made a, a similar board with a round nose and basically just rode it in two foot surf and went great with his two foot. But most of the events he was sort of, you know, three to four foot surf. Mm -hmm. so, Moving on a little bit, in 1978 I did some shaping with Dick Brewer in white and I explained to Dick that I, I had these two extremes of surfboards. I had this round nose twin fin fish inspired by Reno that went great in tiny waves and I had a single fin six foot eight that went great in six foot plus surf but as most of the events were in four to five foot surf I was really struggling. Um, yeah. It was Dick who actually planted the seed for this surfboard. Was Dick Brewer. Yeah, Dick Brewer. He, he, you know, he didn't see it as a major problem. I couldn't figure out how to do it. And he said, it's really simple. You just go home and design a board in between the two boards and take the best aspects of each board and shape it into it. And his theory was that you either you know, take your single fin and make it a little bit wider or you take the, you know, the round nose twin fin and make it narrower. So I went home from Hawaii um, in February of 1978, like all inspired. Um, just went into the shaping room and started messing around with various templates and came up with this this outline curve. Right, right. Um, and basically this shape. And I, I guess that I put some of the, the stuff in it that I knew worked really well on the single fin, as in terms of the thickness, the beak. Um, you know, the thickness carried like right through the board for flotation, the flatter deck for easy, easy paddling. And the, the two things that I knew I needed to do was I needed a, a really deep V bottom in it to actually get it to roll from rail to rail. Because I've ridden twins in their first, um, the first time at the time they were on the design scene, which I think was in the very early 70s. Mm -hmm. um, and I had one that Jeffrey Coyne made in there. It was this little stubby round thing with a, like a hull bottom and tiny little fins on each corner. And that board went great when it was little, but you couldn't get it on a rail. So I had these memories of surfing, you know, those twin fins and all the things that were wrong with it. So I thought, this is what I've got to do with this board, try and design a board that will go on rail and actually give me good performance in a competitive situation. Right, right. So the, the two things that I, I thought were essential were the, the really deep V bottom, which starts up here and carries right through the tail. So it's got a, what you consider a fairly extreme V. So no here. concave? No concave at all. Okay. We didn't, in those days, we didn't, concaves didn't exist. Right, right. It was all either flat bottoms or V bottoms. Okay. And then the other thing, Matt Violas calls it the, the, the hook wing. I actually call it the fluted wing where I just took a surf form and just carved some of this foam out here to actually raise the wing 
to act as more of a like a little sort of fin on the rail, right, right, giving it a little bit more holding power because that's one of the, the negative, um, you know, I guess opinions of twin fins is they can feel a bit loose and a bit sliding. Right, right. So I was working on design things to actually try and overcome that. And the first board, is, the first that board that I'm speaking about in 1978 is a multicolored one that I wrote in the free ride movie. Right, right. Um, and you know, I don't want to sound like an egomaniac, but I actually got it right from the first board. It wasn't a case of, you know, I made the first one and went, well, I got that right, and I got all these other things wrong. I've got to shape another one and fix it. It just felt incredible from the, the first, first one, from the first surf. Like I took it for a surf and went. You know, oh my god, this is unbelievable. The board paddles great, it's got incredible maneuverability, it's got speed, and I felt that I had a secret weapon for that year in 78. Um, you and you, know, that was one of the years we went on to win the world title, right? No, I didn't win the world title in 79, but okay. I had a really good year competitively in 78. Um, I think I got a second place, or I can't remember if I came second or first in the studies on the Gold Coast, riding it, and I won the first of the four Bells titles that year, riding the 78 Twin Fin, and that had been a dream of mine, um, to win the Bells title. So, but it, the board, you know, <laughs> I'm going to sound like I'm saying it because I'm, you know, biased, um, right, right. biased shape of it, it just went so good, I couldn't believe how good it went, and it was really the springboard for all my competitive success and it was a springboard from the world titles um, and when I did the <coughs> retro like redo version of it, which we have here um, I was really conscious about keeping the, the the roots of the board exactly the way it was in 1978 in terms of the outline, the thickness distribution, the beak, the rails, the rocker, you know the wing swallow, the tail, the V and the, the flutes and I spent about a week actually shaping the original board because I had um, I had the free ride board to actually reference. Right, right. And I had the original. I still had the original outline template. So what I did was that over the space of a week, um, I just shaped for a, maybe an hour or two each day, and not just doing specific aspects on the board, like shaping a little bit, referring to the original board, going back, shaping a little bit more because I wanted to get it, you know, exactly the same as right, the original right. board. So. And that's where it evolved. And the, the crazy thing about it is that, you know, even though this this design and this shape is 38 years old, it still actually goes really good. Right. And I mean, there's some incredible footage of uh, Mason Ho. Yeah. Riding this or the 80. I'm not sure which one it is, but uh, Mason's riding an 80. An 80. Yeah. And just ripping them. Yeah. Thing. It's like, like they shouldn't. Like in reality, a board that was designed 38 years ago should not go as good as this board does. Right. Right. So it's. And then, so how did you know, with the fluted, like with this flute going out the wings here, and this raised, and, and just a twin fin, so you're, the, these fins are further back, right, than on a standard thruster. Yeah, twin fins are positioned further back, and it's because of the size of the fin, if they were as far forward as a thruster, it would obviously be just ridiculous. It'd be like woods. sliding yeah, all over sliding the place. Sliding over the place. Okay. So, um, that was one of the ideas, was to move the fins back. And in those days, there were no thrusters either. Mm -hmm. you know, right. We were just we had single fins, so you know I really took a guess on on fin positioning, and it was in relation to where the, the wing was on the board. Like the wings are seven inches from the tail, um, and I had a you know a, a twin fin template that I'd come up with, and I basically just spent some time in the shaping room, like with the board on the stands and two fins I'd had mm -hmm. foiled. Just sort of putting them there, oh, yeah. going, oh, what is that? Mm, yeah, that, that's okay. That's obviously too far. And back. obviously, they weren't yeah. they weren't like click and go. They're no, glass it was on. glass on, so you don't want to get it wrong. So, you know, I, I thought about originally back level with the wings, but it seemed too far back. And then I sort of moved it. You know, started moving them up, and at, at some point, it, they looked about right where right, they right. are. You know, which is ten inches from the tail, and that just seemed like about the right position. Uh -huh. um, and then again with the positioning in from the tail, I just took a guess, it was what looked right. Um, and I s actually splayed them out <coughs> the same amount as the V. It's like, I think if you took like a right angle set square and popped it there, it would be very close to the angle that's leaning out. Uh -huh. And then uh -huh. I've just put um, a little bit of toe in on them, um, just because if you run them parallel to the string as they track. Right, so right, right. sort of. Yeah, again, I, I had worked. all these ideas for it, and it was it was probably a complete miracle that, that, <laughs> that, it, worked. that it worked. But the, the thing in those days is, um, you know, from my point of view as a shaper, I, I, 
when I was when I did something like this, I really thought about what I was doing for a long time before mm -hmm. I did it, and I didn't rush in and do it because you know there were no computer shaping machines in those days, mm -hmm. so you couldn't you know cut a board and then go well I'd like the same board with a little more tail left. Like mm -hmm. you, know, you had to fully commit to you it. You had to commit. You had to hand shape it, and then once it was glass with set fins, there was no experimentation at all. We right, the right. fins were where they were. It wasn't again like a modern surfboard where you can take it down the beach with a fin system and you know you can have five or ten sets of fins and ride it and it'll all feel different with all those fins so so i don't know i i was like uh, yeah it was i was just very it lucky out. very it lucky out. that it all it all worked out all the pre-preparation worked out and the board was an, an incredible success for me mm -hmm. um, and it continues to be a success today mm -hmm. what so I'm sure the viewers want to know, like, what size were you riding back then? Um, I was riding in the '78, six four, six four. Okay, because um, I was riding a six foot eight single fin at the time. Okay, and I thought with a twin fin, I was <coughs> looking for more maneuverability in small surf. So I thought, mm -hmm. okay, I'll go four inches smaller. Mm -hmm. um, I made it 21 inches wide because the single fin I was riding was 20 and a half inches wide. Mm -hmm. So I figured as I was going smaller. Um, I needed to go a little bit wider, and I was just riding two and seven eighths um, thickness on all the boards. Okay, so that's a pretty good size yeah. board in, so, in today's standard. Yeah, so the, the original one I rode and the one in free ride is like six foot four, uh, 21 wide, and two and seven eighths thick. Okay, and how much do you weigh? Um, I'm. And you can do kilos if you don't know. Kilos, pounds. I'm 85 kgs. Okay. Yeah. Ryan Which will do the conversion and then just put it across the bottom of the screen right here, American US pounds. might be about 175 pounds, maybe. Okay. I could be wrong. <laughs> okay. The uh, And then back then, like, you know, now they have the dream tour, you know, they're going yeah. from like the best place in the world to the next best place in the world to the next best place in the world. <laughs> like, back when you were on tour, that wasn't the case, right? Um, we had the... The non-dream tour, right? Yeah, the non. You had like basically they went to the pop, like to the biggest populations rather than to the best. I mean, there were some good events, right, like Hawaii and yeah, Bells had, and stuff well, like that. But you also had, had a lot of like events like in near bigger population bases. Yeah, we we averaged, I think, about fifty percent of the events we were in good surf, uh -huh. and fifty percent were probably in terrible surf. Obviously, we got good surf in Australia. Um, we always got great surf in Hawaii because they had long waiting periods. But the way they ran most of the events was they finished on Saturday and Sunday and the companies that were sponsoring those events um, during the sort of late 70s and the early 80s weren't surfing based companies, they were, you know, they were tire companies and non-surfing clothing companies right. um, and their whole reason for obviously sponsoring the event was you know, they wanted to get as much media coverage as they could and for them it was also really important for the semis and finals to happen on Sunday uh -huh. to have a lot of people on the beach. That was this is like when ABC, ABC and yeah. or NBC, was ABC, right? ABC, yeah. And I think NBC was doing a lot covering it. The, um, Channel Nine Network was covering stuff in Australia, but they wanted to see people on the beach. It's completely different to the way that WSL operates it now. now, where they're in the best waves in the world and they rely on the net coverage. Right, so right. Most of the time. Um, because of that situation, <clears throat> you know, the surf was pretty bad. In the, even if the surf started out good, by the time you got to the weekend, it wasn't that good. So the twin thing just worked incredibly in the surf that um, most of the tour events were held in. So I always felt like I had a secret weapon. Uh -huh. Because I, originally I was the only one riding one, and I felt like I had a board that was faster and more maneuverable and really gave me an advantage. Um, against the guys on single fins and gradually from 78 on after you know when I started doing well competitively on the board um, then other surfers started jumping on them but there was still quite a lot of surfers that um, held out and continued to ride single fins yeah. and so when you had this in your quiver and you're doing the tour did you go back and forth between the twin and the single like based on the waves <laughs> um, the, Traveling quiver for a year on the tour, like the years I won the world title from 79 through to 82, um, I'd start the year with a, a two board quiver, uh -huh. um, which was two twin fins. So that's about 18 less than what most people travel <laughs> with right now. Um, I had a 6.2 and a 6.4, uh -huh. um, and the idea was that those two boards would cover most of the surf that I would encounter on the tour. Um, I'd ride a 6.2 when it was small, 
and if the surf got a little bit bigger, I'd ride a 6.4 and having two, if I broke one, then I had to back up. Right. Um, so I'd virtually ride those for the year until coming into the wine season. And then for the wine season, I'd shape myself a 6.8, a 7-footer, um, 7.4 and a 7.8 single fin. So I had a four board single fin quiver. And there's a lot of um, footage of me riding, you know, the free ride, 1978, twin fin in the wide. But I didn't ride it competitively there. Um, I only rode it on you know, smaller days at off the wall and Rocky Point and Holly Eva. The stories get a bit um, exaggerated over time, but you know, I have people sort of come up to me now and go, wow, you rode that you know, six foot four twin fin at a 15 foot sunset. And I'm right. going, no, no, no. I, I <laughs> Same I, logo, yeah, different I, board. I, I'd love to say I did, but I didn't. Right, right. You know, I rode it on the small So what was like, sure. you know, that six two to six four quiver that you had, like what was the, and this design, like what was the, the sweet spot, like as far as surf size? Well, the 6.2 was actually became the, the 78, the 6.4, I had two 6.4s, mm -hmm. and they were the two boards through 78. And then from 79 onwards, it was the 6.2 and, and the 6.4. Mm -hmm. And the 6.2 was the go-to board all the time. Mm -hmm. Because at two inches shorter compared to the 6.4, it just felt a little freer and a lot more maneuverable and just, you know, it was a board that I knew I could, you know, do well competitively on. And, mm -hmm. the, and the 6.4, I didn't ride it very often. I, I rode it a really big year at Belts mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. when it was, you know, I don't know, it was 15 feet or something or other. And I was right. hopelessly undergun. But what happened that year is that no one expected to get the surf we got at Bells that year. Um, and that no one had any big boards, so we basically made made do made do with what we got. And I rode a six four um, twin fin, and I think you know there's that great footage of Simon Anderson um, in Storm Riders, and he's riding I think the very first thruster with a blue deck, and that was only a six four. Right, so, right. Yeah, I think sometimes in big surf, if you if you really want to catch a wave, you'll the catch you'll make it happen, yeah, right, right. regardless of what you're on, especially with a contest single on. Right, and right. Do stuff or take off on waves that you may not normally take off on. Right. Well, I appreciate you taking the time, cool. Mark, and showing this board and giving us the history behind it. Um, I sure, I sure learned a lot. Uh, you know, we started out the video with with talking about you know how this board was way ahead of its time, and and in listening to the conversation, uh, you know, learned a lot. I tell you what, the 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 coolest thing, one of the coolest things that I heard, I heard actually every part of it was cool, but <laughs> the. Uh, the fact that the board had to perform on Saturday or Sunday. Saturday or Sunday. That right, was, so not like, it didn't have to perform like at the best place in the world, or it didn't have to perform like on the best swell of the year. Yeah. You know, it had to perform on Saturday or Sunday regardless of what the waves were. And that's, uh, I think that's why it's, re I mean, yeah. that's why it's relevant now and why people are going back in this direction because a lot of people, they don't have the ability to yeah. like chase wells around the world. Yeah. And, uh, you know. Yeah. Like strangely, it was it was designed to perform in less than ideal waves. Right, right. Know, in sort of two to four foot, you know, sloppy waves, which was what would you know we were faced with most contest Sundays if you made it to the end of the event. Um, <clears throat> and the reality for surfing, for you know, for most of us, is that most of the time you go surfing, you know, the surf isn't that good. Yeah. You know, if, yeah. I, if I think about the, all the surfs I've had over the last month at home. You know, the average size would be in that sort of three to five foot range. And most of the time it would be, you know, onshore, possibly closing out where you're looking for some ends and some closeouts. Right, right. Um, you know, that dream of every time you go for a surf, it's six foot perfect. hollow and yeah. perfect. It, you know, it doesn't really happen unless you're living in Indonesia or something all year round. Right, right. Well, thanks for spending the time, Mark. We appreciate it. And thanks for tuning in. If you have any more questions on the MR Retro 78, you can give us a call at the shop, 252-987. 6,000 or you can look us up online realwatersports.com forward slash surfing. Thanks for tuning in.